right, good morning. We got some people joining. Uh, just a real quick audio check. Can you guys hear me? hear me it looks like nobody's in the stream right now oh hey faith good morning can you hear me Awesome. I'm not getting any of my feedback I normally get, so I don't know if I turned my volume too far down. Hold on. No, I just don't have it doing anything yet. Yep. Um, you'll see my... I guess you won't see my mouse. Yeah, I still have it on yet. Fantastic. Uh oh. Are we in a playback loop? I'm not getting any playback. Uh -oh. Alright, I'm going to say a magic word, Faith. I need you to type that into the bar. Uh, that magic word is... Swordfish. If, if you heard the magical word swordfish, would you please type that into the chat bar? I'm just trying to see how far back my uh, delay is. Oh, that's not too bad. Okay. All right. So we'll get started here in a second. I have two viewers, and one of them is Faith. I don't know who the other one is, but good morning to you guys. We'll get started here in a few minutes. Um, Try to get started around 8.05, and we'll start with the presentation uh, that I'm doing. Now, I pre-recorded my presentation, but I'm going to be in here, too, just to provide some feedback. If you have any questions, I can stop the presentation. I'm going to answer the questions as we go. So, there will be a magic word. I'll actually stop the presentation to give the magic word for the quiz, which will be up at 10 o'clock. How about that? Sound good to everybody? Sounds good to you. Uh, you can always send me an emoji uh, in the bottom left hand corner. Like a smiley face. Uh, mine's freaking out. I don't want me to do that. Oh, there we go. Ready to go? Eight oh three. Let's make sure we're in here. I 
Alright, while we wait, I think I can play nondescript music without getting in trouble. We're just going to play some epic music, as I like to call it, while we wait for a couple more people to get in, and then we'll get started. The public domain music. We're getting very close. Hope you guys are enjoying this. This is Carmen Barina, O oh Fortuna. This is the music used. Whenever there's an epic moment. All right. It's time to crush out some history. Are you ready? Are you getting pumped? Because you should be. It's the greatest moment of your young lives. All right, how epic was that? Are you guys ready to go? Well, here we go. Mr. Cantaloupe, it's starting.
can't hear the video. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on. Pause me. No. Be quiet, Parker. Alright. Let's see. You can't hear the video at all? It's quite disappointing. Alright. Well, we will just remove that for now. And we'll start over. Oops. I want to move it from the whole video, though. Alright, can you guys hear me talking? No, you can't hear me talking right now? You can hear me in the chat bar put down the words elephant or put down the word elephant in and out I don't understand what the volume is going in and out that doesn't make sense saying it's picking up everything I'm saying. But for some reason it's not giving me the feedback that normally does. Normally it's telling me that I am not. Let's try to go from here. All right. Platinum snipers. Wow, coward. That is amazing. Uh, so you're almost done. He's almost to Damascus. All right, guys. Let's get started. The War and the Elephant. <laughs> the end of the Classical Age and beginning of the Peloponnesian War. All right, guys. So the... War Between the Well and the Elephant is a great acronym for what is about to happen. But first, we need to end the Classical Age. Remember last time we talked about how the Classical Age was a time in Greece of great growth, uh, both through education and through invention. Um, we see schools pop up. We see great philosophers pop up. Um, we see uh, all kinds of fantastic um, growth in the human mind. Uh, we see science and math and geography, uh, history, the arts, uh, specifically drama, sculpting, and architecture. We see all these things pop up during the Classical Age, and it's such a very important age in ancient Greece. But it's not just uh, flowers and rainbows, as they say. It's not just good things. The Classical Age brings about the time of the height of Greek culture, but also the depravity of Greek warfare. Uh, warfare for the Greeks used to be just, uh, if you win, you win. If you lose, you lose. Sometimes slaves would be taken. Peloponnesian War changes that. We're going to see the massive, um, we'll see massive massacres of peoples of different Greek city-states by the aggressors. Um, it was quite a bloody war. It was quite a bloody time. And we're really going to dive into it. In the first place, we have to start uh, and, and I think one of the great acronyms of history is history likes to repeat itself. Um, and I'll give you an example of this as we get moving. So, here we go. 
Tensions rise. Following the defeat of the Persians, the Athenians created an alliance of city-states to help in the defense of the Greek mainland. The Delian League, as it was called, was led by Athens. Each city-state in the league provided Athens with troops and tribute. The purpose of this league was to deter Persian aggression in the region. So following the Persians' defeat, the Athenians go, look, we got to stay united or the Persians are going to come back. We have to create a buffer, a defense against the Persians so they don't just come back in here and take over our, our land again, right? They've already come back once, right? We beat them at Marathon, and they came back with the second Persian invasion. We can't afford that, especially after Athens was burned to the ground. I mean, we're talking the Parthenon was destroyed. The Acropolis was destroyed. Athens was burnt to the ground. So, in response, Athens says, look, we got to gather people together. we got to form a, uh, a nice, large league of groups of people to defend uh, Greece. And so they went out to Greek city states and said, hey, join us, we'll make a defense force, and we'll keep back the aggressions of the Persians. Now, I told you before, the Spartans and the Athenians, pretty much every Greek city state, they don't really trust each other at all. Uh, we see that so much so, because as soon as the Delian League is formed, the Spartans form their own league, and this league is called the Peloponnesian League. It was made from people um, on the Pen uh, on the uh, Penelopus or, or uh, in the Penelopus or the peninsula, um, and so the Peloponnesian League was in direct response to the Delian League. They were there to check the power of the Delian League. Again, Sparta and Athens can't get along in the same sandbox, and so Athens gains a group of people to support it. Sparta is going to gain a group of people to support it. So this is as tensions start rising, and, and when I said history repeats itself. One of the main causes of the First World War was these uh, European states all form these alliances with one another. You know, if you attack Belgium, Great Britain will attack you. And if you attack Great Britain, uh, France will attack you. And so they had all these secret alliances between each other. Very much so, right, in, in with the leagues, right? Sparta is friends with Corinth. And if Corinth goes to war, Sparta will go to war. And if Sparta goes to war, Thebes will go to war. And so all these alliances and allegiances start popping up all around the Greek mainland. And so tensions start rising. But again, classical age, uh, Athens used the Delian League to really um, support its growth. This statue is a great, or these statues, are, they're not really statues, they're actually columns. They're support columns. But they're shaped like statues. These were made during the classical age, and they were made with money from the other members of the Delian League. So the Athenians are using this as a way to profit um, before the war begins. Right? They use their other members to get wealthier and to increase their own abilities. Not just in the arts, but also in the sciences. I mean, this helped, the Delian League helped formulate ph philosophy and psychology and many other great fields of study. And here's the difference. The difference is between the Dalian League and the Peloponnesian League. The Dalian League had a large, well-trained navy. It was democratic in nature. It was opposed to monarchy and the power of the Persian Empire. The Peloponnesian League had a large, well-trained army. Each state was an oligarchy, and it was opposed to the democracies of the Dalian League. An uh, oligarchy is a government that's ruled by a few uh, very powerful families. All right. So a few very powerful families rule in an oligarchy. They share the power and they rule. Uh, typically they'll have a monarch, but that monarch is um, really contingent on leadership from the other leading families. Now the Dalian League, um, we refer to them as the whale. Okay, Athens is the whale. The whale is the largest uh, ocean mammal, very powerful mammal. Um, and so the Dalian League is considered the whale because they had a large navy. The Peloponnesian League is considered the elephant because they had a very strong army. Right? Elephant is the strongest land animal. Uh, and then, of course, the whale is the strongest um, marine mammal. All right. Move it forward. This is a great map of what the Dalian League looked like. Except for Attica. I don't know why they didn't color it Attica. Um, Attica is, let's see if I can get my pencil, I can, sweet, 
and I want a highlighter. I want that highlighter in red. Attica is, uh, oh, there it goes for me. Uh, it's this area here in red that is getting filled in for me. Um, that red area is the Gillian leaf, all right? Um, and so that red area that I colored in is Athens as well. So breaking down the leagues into groups, we have the Delian League, which is made up of Athens, Aegina, Byzantium, uh, Chios, Libos, Lindus, Naxos, Paros, Samos, Thebes, and Teos. Uh, the list does not include all the city-states who donated money. And in fact, what you'll see is Thebes right here. I'm actually going to highlight them. They will actually switch sides from time to time. Um, they originally were saying they were going to start out in the Delian League, but they end up joining the Peloponnesian League. Uh, in charge of that, the Delian League, of course, was Athens. Um, and then there was many other states that donated money. The states I have just donated troops and ships. Uh, the Peloponnesian League was made up of Sparta, Corinth, Caiatha, uh, Kyritha, Thira, Melos, Pylos, uh, Mentia, Elis, uh, Epidaurus, Boetia. Boetia actually joins really, really, really late. Uh, Lefkada and Ambrakia. Uh, Corinth provided the majority of the ships in the alliance. They actually had two ports, one on both sides of the, uh, one on the Aegean and one on the other side. And so what we see is the Peloponnesian League uh, is really made up of much larger city-states, uh, like Corinth and Thebes, and Athens, or the Delian League, is made up of smaller city-states, um, specifically the ones in Ionia and Attica, I mean, Ionia and the other parts of the Aegean. All right, here's a great picture of it. Um, you can see in yellow is the Dalian League. Uh, there's Athens, there's an Attica, Thebes is in red because they're with um, Sparta and this part of the war. Uh, and you can see all across the region the different colors. All right, the boiling point. In 545 BC, or 534 BC, the League's treasury was transferred to Athens. So the Dalian League's treasury where they kept all their money, was moved to Athens. So Athens becomes the predominant power because they have all the money. Money is power. Uh, the alliance had become an empire in all but name. So the alliance was now serving as an empire. For the next 20 years, Athens used its power to gain control over the other members of the league. And in fact, they used that power, that wealth, that prestige, really as a cudgel. A cudgel is a, um, like a wooden club to just beat around all the other members to get them to do what they wanted them to do. All right, so they use that cudgel as a way to uh, make other members do what they said when they said do it. And so Athens really gains the power at this point. Uh, tensions between the leagues reached an all-time high in 433 BC when Athens signed a treaty of mutual protection with Cor uh, Corsera, um, which became later Corsica, uh, one of the few other city-states with a major navy of its own. So what we see is this uh, this real quick change between the two uh, and there's some other things that create tension one of them is uh, some people from Corinth Sparta's ally end up raiding a town well they get caught doing it and all 200 of them are executed on the spot and that really 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 creates a lot of issues between Athens and Sparta and it really will lead to the war but this really uh, major event was in 433 the uh, Treaty of Mutual Protection with Corsica, allowing Athens to get the majority of control that it needed on the ocean. Alright, this war is going to be fought between uh, foot soldiers. For the most part, we're going to see a lot of... Uh, er, well, it's going to be fought between the Hopolites. Now, the Hopolites are going to be um, mixed in now with archers and other members like that. And you'll see that throughout the war. Now, the Peloponnesian War is best classified as the war between the elephant and the whale. And we already talked about why. All right, the elephant, of course, was the Spartans and her allies. They had very strong ally, uh, very strong militaries. They had very, very strong militaries. That military 
was able to defeat um, the enemy's armed land very easily. Sorry, I got distracted, guys. Let me get back to that. The Peloponnesian War is best classified between the war between the elephant and the whale. The elephant, being Sparta, uh, had a strong military, and they were able to win anywhere on land. And so their principal strategy was to attack Athens, and they would attack annually. They would typically attack during the summer when it's better uh, time to go fight. You'll see that throughout history. The better time to fight is always in the summer. Most of the time, armies don't want to move during the uh, winter. We see the disasters of what armies have tried to move during the winter, especially the French invasion of Russia and then the German invasion of Russia. Both went extremely poorly uh, because they attacked during the winter, or they were in Russia during the winter. Terrible idea. If you ever invade a country, don't invade Russia in the winter. All right. So, uh, the principal strategy was to annually um, attack the Athenian lands, starting in 431 BC, creating as much devastation as possible, such as burning farms, chopping down olive trees and vineyards. However, the actual effect on this, on the Athenian economy, really is unclear, especially when we consider that the city would always be resupplied uh, by the sea via the uh, ports of Piraeus. So, Piraeus is the... Um, Athenian port, and I'll show you in a minute why that's so important, but the start, Spartan strategy really didn't work at all. Um, the Athenians just hid behind their walls, and the Spartans would go around and try to get them into a major battle. Athens would never do it. They knew better than to get in a, a land battle in, with Sparta, and so instead, what they would do is they would uh, sail around, and here's an example. So, um, they would jump on their boats, and sail around the Spartan armies. They'd land their troops and destroy Spartan towns and farms. The Spartan army would have to return to, Athens, uh, to Sparta to defend their land. And this is how they transferred around. This is how they moved around. For the most part, there were very few major battles. Athens refused to engage Sparta on an open battlefield. Sparta, for the most part, could never field a major naval force to contend with the Athenians. So, really, a lot of small battles that were meaningless. But... What it did bring about were a lot of massacres. When the Spartans stopped in the town and they realized they weren't getting any gain out of attacking it, they just decided, you know what, we'll just kill the population. We'll just wipe them out. And so we see these atrocities committed by either side. We see either side using other city-states to do their bidding. Uh, we call these proxies. They put those out to, to attack each other. So Spartan and Athens really stepped up the level of violence with this war and really changed the ways wars were fought in that region. Alright, so check this out. This is the Peloponnesian War. Uh, this is the picture of Piraeus and Athens. Uh, going around it is the North Long Wall and the South Long Wall. Now those walls connected Piraeus with Athens, and that would allow them to defend themselves from attack uh, by the Spartans, all right? So that long wall really prevented the uh, Spartans from really affecting the Athenians. Piraeus was the city port, and so grains and uh, materials would land at Piraeus, and then they'd be escorted along that alleyway in between the two walls all the way up to Athens where they would be safe, and they'd be locked away. And that is how they made sure their supplies were protected from the Spartans. The Spartans really couldn't do anything uh, about this. And this long wall was actually paid for and supported by the um, Delian League. So the Delian League paid for this wall basically to go up. The problem with it is the uh, Athenians were depending on the Egyptians for grain. And unbeknownst to them, when they sent for grain, it came back and it was poison all right and so because of that poison grain the Athenians are going to get sick that sickness is going to spread and kill something like one-fourth of their population uh, to two-thirds of their population Sparta was like hey we don't want any part of that they actually backed their armies away from Athens during that time really really bad but that wall was crucial now I'm going to let you guys watch a video um, with me on here and I'm going to stop it at certain points I don't know if it's going to work I hope it works We'll see. <coughs> um, but let's see if we can do this. If we can't, I will link it in the description. Here we go. Hey guys, I need you to stop playing around on the uh, chat and pay attention. Thank you. Alright. 
Guys, I need you to let me know if this if you can hear the volume on this video or not. You guys can't hear anything. Oh, it's having issues with its videoing. I have to work out this technology issue. Okay, well, we'll get to that later. Guys, I'm going to link that video because I really want you to watch that on the Peloponnesian War. But let's go ahead and let's talk about who wins and the outcome. So Sparta's going to end up winning the war. And I'm sorry if that's a spoiler to any of you, but Sparta's victory will lead to their control over Greece for a very short amount of time. In fact, uh, they end up going and fighting a couple of small battles that really bankrupt Sparta, this little small wars that bankrupt Sparta, as they try to keep people under control. Well, it doesn't work very long. The, uh, a group of people living to the north of them called the Macedonians use this opportunity to invade. They'd always treated the Macedonians like they were barbarians. And so they pushed down and they invaded under a king of the name of Philip I. Now Philip is going to push his way into, um, Greece and he's going to take over lots of city-states and he's going to work his way down all the way until all of Greece is under his control. The important thing about Philip is his son will become the greatest conqueror in the Greek world and that is Alexander the Great. So the age of the Greeks having their own control, their own civilizations is coming to an end. Soon they will be under the power or authority of Alexander the great and then the Romans. But um, the classical age has come to its end. With the end of the Peloponnesian War, the classical age is over. Both sides are pretty much bankrupt, and uh, that is about it. All right, guys, I hope you've enjoyed that lesson. I'm going to make sure I put all this information up on your team's page so it's linked to you and uh, making sure you guys can stay in touch. Okay, guys. I'm going to be switching over to YouTube Live here in a few minutes as I send 
all this information out to you via Teams. If you have any questions, that is the time to get a hold of me. Thank you so much, guys. I will catch you later. All right, bye.